Hello and welcome to Instant Gratification. I'm Jed Wagman. And I'm Summer Gamble. We're both BFI Film Academy Young Programmers and we're delighted to introduce our event today at the 66th BFI London Film Festival. We're very sorry to have to draw you away from Netflix or Amazon Prime right now. We know there's loads of great new shows on at the minute that you're probably keen to finish. But that's exactly why we wanted to create this panel, to talk through the rise of high-end TV and why it's captured our attention so much over recent years. With such a growth in streaming and the way we consume shows, television is changing, which is why we're here now at a film festival discussing TV. It's been such a pleasure putting together this event for you. And without further ado, we'll hand over to our amazing host, Rowan Woods, and our amazing panelists to get the discussion started. Hi, my name is Rowan Woods. I'm the series and episodic programmer for the BFI London Film Festival. Um, welcome to this Young Programmers panel, which will explore the current TV landscape and how the rise of streaming has impacted what we watch, when we watch it, and how we watch it. Um, I'm joined by a brilliant panel of experts who'll dive into this topic with me. Um, I'm going to ask them to say a little bit about who they are, what they do, and I'm also going to ask them what they're watching at the moment and what their favourite show of the year has been. So um, Hannah Flint, uh, film critic and author of Strong Female Character. Hi, welcome. Oh, thanks for having me. Yes, my uh, debut book, which is kind of part memoir, part movie criticism, is out uh, 29th, so it'll be out by the time this, this goes out. And I write for Empire Magazine, BBC Culture, Time Out, anywhere that will pay me, <laughs> doing, you know, reviews about film and television, and um, particularly have a particular interest in genre TV, especially the superhero stuff and the Star Wars stuff. So no surprise that my favourite show at the moment is Andor. Um, loving the first three episodes and I'd say my favorite um, TV show of the year would be Station Eleven uh, which is on Stars Play UK. Great choices. Um, so we're also joined by uh, Oliver Littleton, um, screenwriter and creator of TV shows Cheaters and Wedding Season uh, which both aired this year. Ollie, hi, welcome. What have you been watching? Uh, so I have been watching, uh, I just finished The Baby uh, Sean Robbins Grace's show, which I really enjoyed. It's got a very distinctive and weird kind of vibe, but uh, but I was actually like really moved by it by the end as well. Um, and I think my my favorite of the year is a Thai uh, pachinko, uh, which is on Apple TV, which is uh, absolutely gorgeous, sort of historical epic, uh, and uh, Big Boys on for Jack Rooks. Uh, absolutely lovely sort of uh, coming of age comedy. Great. Um, and Lisa Kerrigan, Senior Curator of Television at the BFI National Archive. Um, so Lisa, first tell us what that means uh, and then tell us uh, what, you're, what you're watching and what's your favourite thing you've seen this year. First of all, thanks for having me. So I, part of what I do involves selecting contemporary television for acquisition to the National Archive. So those programs are then preserved as part of the National Collection. And I also care for our historical collections of over a million television programs, um, mainly dating back to the 50s. So that's a lot of TV. Um, at the moment, I'm, I'm looking forward to new episodes of Bad Sisters every week. And I'm, I'm also, I'm always like a couple of episodes into about half a dozen things. So I'm also watching A League of Their Own. And Am I Being Unreasonable as well? Uh, my favourite programmes of the year are probably, well, it started last year, but it finished into this year. So I think it counts. Yellow Jackets and also the final series of Dairy Girls. So Girls of the 90s, essentially. Perfect. Um, so... Um... Lisa, you're particularly well suited, um, but I hope we, we will all talk about this a little bit to think about how um, we'll take as our jumping off point, the question of how TV has changed over the last 10 years. I think there has been a huge, um, a huge shift in um, what we watch, the way we watch it, how we watch it, um, and all of those things are interrelated. Um, so we will get into the weeds in all of those things, but what I'm gonna ask you all to do first is perhaps just pick one thing that you think has um, changed uh, over the past over the past ten years in the way that we watch that we watch TV. Uh, Lisa, you, you you start. 
it's easy really it's it's viewing habits and streaming services i mean we're now this year is the 10th anniversary of netflix in the uk um, and it's nearly hard to remember what it was like 10 years ago before we had these services and the type of access that we do now it's really transformed how audiences engage with television and how they think about it on a day-to-day -day basis great we will definitely come back to that and dig dig into that a little bit more um ollie uh, I mean, I, I'd, I'd say it's almost just the sheer volume of of stuff that's being made. Um, you know, I, I was a I was a journalist, uh, a sort of film film journalist before uh, I moved into screenwriting. And and when I started, the website that I wrote for didn't even really cover TV. They would do a couple of things. And, and uh, you know, and now it's it, I, I would say it's, you know, and, and Hannah can probably speak to this better than I can. But but it feels like almost every film critic will will cover tv almost as much as they do you know cinema um so you know there's there's you know i i've sort of joked with friends that um making tv now is a little bit like when we went to the edinburgh fringe where you're just desperately trying to hand out flyers to people to be like hey you know and then you look over there and dustin hoffman is doing sort of is, has done three series of a show that you've never heard of and because it, it's on some streaming service you've never heard of and and um, so, yeah, it's it's um, it's fascinating, and it, it, I think it comes with with challenges, um, particularly in in terms of production stuff. But um, but it's exciting as well. I think it's allowed all kinds of new voices to emerge and and things like that. Great, Hannah. I mean, I suppose one thing I've noticed is there's far more diversity on screen than ever before. You know, I suppose uh, one of the things I know is like a show like. Um, we are lady parts you know you can't imagine that series ever getting commissioned 10 years ago and then even something like you know I, I cover a lot of kind of Middle East and North Africa representation on screen and so shows like Rami or Mo more recently like those things that are so specific about both like Middle Eastern culture but also Muslim culture um you wouldn't you wouldn't get that on TV you might get you know, an indie film. And I think um, Shireen Darbis, who actually just got nominated for an Emmy uh, for directing an episode of Only Murders in the Building, but I spoke to her recently and she'd done these two films that basically kind of in the early 2010s, uh, early 2010s, that kind of looked at that immigrant Arab experience. And yet when, you know, Rami comes along, suddenly it's like, this is, oh my God, breakthrough. Now we're finally seeing it for the first time. So in a way, sometimes it feels like TV is um, giving space for um, more diverse writers, filmmakers to be able to like bring stories that have obviously already been seen, but actually to a more mainstream audience rather than getting a few, you know, might do like the curves on cinema or get a few screens here and there, but this is like everywhere. Everyone can see it and obviously Rami on Hulu and then it comes out, I think it's, what is it, on Stars Play? And you, again, that whole system of like where it gets distributed is something we'll probably talk about as well, but just being able to reach a bigger audience is something that we never have or even something you know you know the kind of Danish series like that like suddenly international cinema and TV has become more I don't know more part, part of our com cultural conversations nowadays. Absolutely and I think of course that's also linked to 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 the, to the volume there is so much out there and all kinds of different uh, things for different different tastes different palettes different audiences. Um, so we'll dig into all of those things a little bit more. Let's start with uh, the streaming services. Obviously, um, Netflix, we now have many, many, many more streaming services, arguably perhaps too, too many. And, you know, one of the big things that um, uh, Netflix ushered in was this idea of uh, viewing on demand rather than watching at, you know, everyone sitting down and watching uh, at nine o'clock on a Sunday, uh, whatever was being served up to us on the terrestrial channels. Lisa, can you talk a little bit about sort of your observations around um, sort of how that has impacted audiences and that sort of this idea of streaming, streaming on demand? Yes, well, obviously, Netflix are the pioneers of the, the binge streaming box set of dropping all episodes at once so you can swallow up in a weekend and then like yearn for this next series to come out next year. You know, so I think it's really interesting that actually we see more and more of the streamers adopting more flexible models around, around releasing episodes and around releasing series and kind of seeing the benefits that broadcasters have had of, of releasing things weekly, whereby then you can have a kind of an ongoing conversation about how a series is developing, or you can split it into two parts as they've been doing with um, 
Stranger Things as well. It's sort of, it's, it's much more flexible model now than it used to be, um, which still makes it, makes it difficult for audiences to keep up still um, as to what's being released when and, and whether something is weekly or whether it's all coming all at once. It's quite difficult to track, but I mean, as we've been saying, there's kind of more and more to enjoy in that. Mm. And and what and what do you think the um the reasons are between um uh you know something being released uh, all at once and something being released weekly or something being released uh in two parts you know is that just uh, is that down to creative decisions is that down to business decisions is it about retaining subscribers um what what are some of those reasons I think it's a combination of those things and it more more you listen to um, executives and creatives, the decisions seem to be based around the content of the series or the type of the series and what is suitable to an audience for a particular show if they will, if they will enjoy that slow burn of a weekly episode or if they will prefer a binge so it seems to, it's feeding into um, into the commissioning process as well, those kind of strategies about how things will be released is mm -hmm. yeah. I was going to add that, you know, one of the things I found when I was doing more kind of coverage of, you know, ratings, viewer, viewership and all that, you know, obviously Netflix is very difficult to get ratings for because, you know, notoriously secretive, but a lot of the conversation about like the social conversation and actually at first when they were doing the binge, like it was like whole about binging as all well, everyone watch it as soon as you can watch, drop it on a Friday, you spend the whole weekend watching it, but then you had series like like Altered Carbon, which was a really great series, but that kind of, it lost traction. No one was really talking about it a few days afterwards. And I think now we're seeing far more series, whether it's the Disney Plus are pretty much doing that kind of weekly release strategy, but also doing a thing where it's like everywhere at the same time, which I quite like, cause I'm like, you know, whether I have to get up at 8 a.m. <laughs> if I wanna watch something without getting spoilers. And I just accept that social media is, is the outer rim it's lawless <laughs> if you don't watch it and don't go on to go don't go on twitter if you don't want it to be spoiled when it comes to tv i think cinema is a totally different conversation because obviously not everyone can get to the theatrical release at exactly the same time but you are seeing that where i think people enjoy that kind of and you have a conversation that lasts throughout the week and then it builds up and picks up again so i think we didn't have social media like this when you know 10 years ago 20 20 years ago and stuff so even just accounting for that sort of you know, word of mouth conversation, that's what I think they're recognising now when it comes to, you know, releasing of series. Ollie, you, so you have just had your uh, your second show uh, launch on Disney Plus uh, a couple of weeks back, um, and that went up all at all at once. Were there conversations in, in the in the process around how that would how that would work? Uh, I, I think it, there was a sort of strategy shift, I think, in that when we were commissioned, I think the, the plan was to, to drop everything was to do weekly releases and and I think what they weren't sure about the time is is uh, you know I, and or I think just drop three episodes to begin with and then they're going weekly after that you shows have sort of different sort of um, rhythms to, to how that's been working um, I think ultimately so so we were sort of making it thinking it was going to be weekly releases and then at some point I assume that the great algorithm, you know, sort of reported back that certain things do better when they're sort of dropped all at once. And 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 that's how we ended up going. Um, so, yeah, it's I mean, it's it's interesting. I think I, I, I think different shows benefit from different different sort of patterns, I think. Um, I, I think what we're finding is that that um, from what I've been told, people like people are getting through wedding season quite quickly like like they're, they're watching it in sort of a couple of sittings over a couple of nights um and uh you know which I, I think is a good sign um whereas you know something like you know house of the dragon for example like i think it really does benefit from as hannah was saying the, the, the conversation every week that sort of water cooler um sort of you know people going into work and being like did you see it did you you know all of that sometimes having watched it over breakfast or whatever that's that was Hannah watching it over breakfast um <laughs> yeah. waking up the minute I wake up it's like put it on she <laughs> put it on but also that's when I was when I was working in certain places like 
you'd get because like in Game of Thrones, it used to go out in the US the day before on a Sunday night. And then on the Monday, it would show in the, U- in the UK and I'd be spoiled for it. It'd be so frustrating because I'd have to write about it afterwards. So, <laughs> you know, that's, the, that's what comes with the territory when you cover things. Sometimes you get spoiled when you don't even want to be. <laughs> mm. And we talked, we were talk- um Hannah, you were touching on this a little bit, um, but talking about how, um, how these changes have impacted uh, the cultural conversation. You know, if if it's not one big show on BBC every week that everyone talks about, you know, there's there are so many different cultural conversations that can be happening at any one time. And certain shows can just slip under the radar and certain shows, you know, potentially like, say, a Lord of the Rings, if they have uh, an awful lot of money invested in that show being successful and popular, they have a lot of marketing weight that they can put put behind it does it make it harder for shows shows to cut cut through does that make it a more sort of uh a, a sort of difficult landscape for audiences to find the things that they like well you said you know marketing that plays whether it's whether it's tv or cinema that's like a massive massive thing for you know uh, i know someone who recently released mr malcolm's list which is you know british rom-com anyone loves Bridget, bridgertons they'll be like this is perfect for them and the marketing campaign was pretty much non-existent um and then there's also a thing where you know i said station 11 i thought in america like station 11 was this revelatory series like i'd see people talking about it they did like a kind of podcast like as a companion piece to the series. And then because it's on Stars Play UK, which is a kind of streaming service that you can watch within your Prime membership. So it's kind of, it, it makes it a lot harder. And I have no one's really been talking about it. So when I started watching it, I was like, who's who's watching it in the UK? Why is no one talking about this this show? So so yeah, I think it, it, it kind of does depend on the streaming service. Again, Apple TV is another great example. I mean, The Morning Show, obviously with all the starry names and that, um, and also maybe the bad reviews for it. People not really liking it has created this thing that people are interested in it and because it gets nominated for things. But then I compare it, compare it to like the series Mythic Quest, which I think is so good, or like The After Party. And you mentioned Bad Sisters, but I don't can't really see much of the conversation on it because I think Apple is still... I don't think as many people are usually are as on that streaming service or have subscriptions to that compared to like the, I don't know, like it's like we talk about the big free broadcasters, but now it's like the big, <laughs> big streaming services, which is basically Netflix, Prime, and I'd say at the moment Disney Plus. Is it tr- is it also fair to say that um, uh, th- it has changed the way people engage uh, journalists engage with t- engage with tv the way that sort of the cultural conversation around tv i mean ollie you were talking about um sort of writing for um uh an online platform at a time when that was still a relatively small thing and being there sort of during the time when when that that exploded um has that changed how how tv is is treated as a as an art form yeah and i mean i think it's uh you know i'm i'm, I'm heartened I, I think sometimes in in the UK, uh, TV criticism has been something that you give to some, you know, a, a funny journalist who, who, um, who can say some sort of withering stuff about it, and it feels like it's being taken more seriously as an art form in the way that people like Emily Nussbaum in in the US, you know, uh, great writers like that. Um, but I think, it, I mean, it, there's been some interesting patterns. I I feel like I learnt a lot about writing tv from reading av club recaps and vulture and and this dates me a bit but uh, television without pity which was a, one of the first sort of sites that kind of did that sort of thing on on shows like lost um and and there it felt like almost everything was covered all the time now it's even i think even to for for these sort of big pop culture sites um they physically don't have the, the the money or the time or the people to cover every show in that level of detail. So it's it's always interesting to see which are the ones that break through uh, and, and don't. And, and often it's not the ones you sort of expect it to be, I think. Like, you know, I, it feels like when Netflix launched, House of Cards was their big sort of, you know, the big starry drawing. It was David Fincher and it was Kevin Spacey and Robin Wright. And... And yeah, it felt like Orange is the New Black was the one that cut through, which was the show that people weren't really expecting to. And and similarly with with Apple, they've had you know these these very big budget things, and and it was Ted Lasso that that was the one that became the thing that won the Emmys. And 
this summer I haven't been able to see it yet, but the the bear was the show that everybody in the US has been talking about. Um, you know, to, to some extent, up against things that are that are much more had much more hype behind them in advance. But um, you know, it's it's interesting. I think you. you good shows find an audience i think um and and the the word of mouth that that we were talking about you know that sort of weekly release can sometimes you know i, I think you you can see over the course of a season like a, a show going really kind of building up momentum and of course social media has made word of mouth uh, a much speedier speedier thing um uh lisa sort of T taking the sort of the the, the, the long view of, of sort of um, TV over the past few decades, what, what are your observations about sort of the way that kind of the culture around TV and sort of audiences and sort of internet culture has uh, the, the impact that that has had? Yeah, it's enormous. Obviously, I appreciated the shout out to television without pity as well. I was also an aficionado. Um, it it does make it really difficult to kind of keep track of everything now. So you do. Uh, you do kind of have to find your space. Um, I mean, I find it, it's, it's part of my job to track all of these things and it's, it's difficult. Um, it's hard to, to, to bring all of those things together. I think people are, are kind of developing their own strategies for that. I know, you know, people keep spreadsheets of what they want to watch. It, it was not that way before. Um, but when it comes to social media, that's, um, that's where it's, um, the, the weekly model of the of releasing those programs that you can take part in those conversations and also that that idea of of programs being released simultaneously across territories so that conversation is international whereas historically we'd have to be waiting for American TV shows to come over here. I mean, we still yeah, are a little bit. When, when the bear. The <laughs> yeah. I would still it You're still like, does hey, happen with something unless you have your ways and means, of course. Um, <laughs> I mean, that notion of you know Game of Thrones or now House of the Dragon coming out at two in the morning, and so you have to be right on it if you do want to be part of that conversation. But also, if if professionally, if you're a critic, you have to be you have to be on it. So um, yeah, it feels like running running to keep standing still a lot of the time. I did some recaps for um, the book of Boba Fett, so it was like waking up in the morning, getting those knocked out, and filing it and getting it. But it's funny because when I was first starting out, even show was like doing recaps and stuff I remember watching like Big Brother and happens to do a recap of what happened the night before I feel like everyone everyone wants to kind of like if they don't have time to watch the series they kind of want to know what's going on also there's a big thing on I suppose within news outlets is because it's all about clicks so they'll be do SEO headlines like when I used to write stuff for Screen Rant when I was first transitioning into just being freelance and writing specifically about film and tv um you know you do seo stories and like what's what 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 are the seo phrases <laughs> that are kind of people searching for and let's create a headline out of that and it'd be like any angle could get off like when netflix had the marvel series i got a, i wrote countless pieces on there just for like this is what this means or what does this person's introduction who are they you know all those type of things but what's interesting was how I spoke to someone recently who was doing a TV show for a streamer and they had to reshoot scenes because they had to have the algorithm and like, they need to have this phrase. This is a searchable phrase. So now we need to incorporate that into the plot. <laughs> So they had to reshoot certain scenes so that it would come up when they do the algorithm. And I was watching, uh, and there's a thing in, um, there's a sort of, I had screen access for this, this series called The Reboot, a reboot, which is an Hulu series. And there's like a whole thing about how they've got this per character who was in like, uh, you know, in, in research data handling. Now she's like the vice president of comedy. And she's talking about, oh, we need this, we need this actor who can't act, but she's a reality TV show star. But because she she's got an audience which is like 16 to 35, we'll cast her in it rather than her being. So a lot of it, it feels like now we kind of seeing a, I don't know, you, you, yeah, Ollie can speak to this more, but like how actually now it's a case of getting the ingredients to try and like get people's attentions in a way that feels less organic than just actually writing a series that might be good it's like let's make sure we have all these bits going in just to get those like figures the same way that we're trying to do in online journalism trying to get views it's kind of demoralizing a little bit yeah I mean it, I you know and, and what I will say because I definitely we, we made cheaters without a broadcaster which is very unusual for for tv it was it was sort of funded by the production company and, and bbc studios 
so as a result we never had sort of studio notes on it so going from that to to working with you know the almighty mouse we were i, I think we were definitely concerned about what what things would be but actually they were they were incredibly you know that there, there, there was there was, you know in that case certainly there were no questions of, of of them coming in and and saying you know you have to put this phrase in or you have to do anything like that they were very sort of um relaxed but uh i'm you know i'm sure not every uh you know not every streaming service is like that so of course um uh in the way that um you know film and tv is engaged with by uh by fans by um you know by websites um that's just one of the ways in which um the gap between film and television is closing um lisa can you talk a little bit about sort of what that looks like in terms of the actual content that we're that we're watching that the, the shows that we're watching i mean the sort of the quality has has gone up remarkably is that fair to say well yeah it's interesting to think about what we what we mean when we talk about high-end television and do we do we just mean budgets does high-end just mean expensive or is there an aesthetic quality to that um because a lot of these things they particularly um Marvel and Star Wars properties, they're, they're using the same, using all the same materials you would use to make a film. Um, where TV comes into its own is with what TV has always had, the luxury of time. So you have, you have a longer time to tell a story, you have more time to engage with characters, you can go off in different directions. Um, what that means for the difference between film and TV, I think, I think there's always space for, when we think about films, we're possibly now we're thinking less about a mode of release than a, like a single dramatic work or a single comedic work. It's, a story, it's an encapsulated story in a shorter space of time. If, if we want to talk about TV as series and film as a singular work, I think that makes more sense to me now that now that, as you say, these, these kind of areas have collapsed into each other a little bit, um, certainly in the kind of streaming environment that we're in now. Ollie, you write across both uh, film and, and TV. Um, what are the differences for, for you from a, from a writing point of view? Is it just about time? Are you still are you able to, to sort of realise the vision in both, in both spaces? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm 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 just starting to dip my toe into into film right now, and the and the you know the the sort of legend of of being a, a film screenwriter is that you get treated much worse than you do as a TV writer. I, I think, uh, but uh, you know, I'm I'm having a nice time so far. Um, but you know, I think I think what has started to shift in the last few years, it I, it felt that. The, the kind of peak TV boom meant that almost everything that was, you know, and particularly with books and, and sort of true life stories, you were st sort of starting to get, everything was almost defaulting to becoming a series or a limited series. And and I think we all, uh, well, I don't know if we all dread, but, but every so often you'll hear someone be like, yeah, we approached it more as an eight hour movie than we did as a series. <laughs> I'm always like, oh no, no. Because um, I think TV, you know, TV is its own medium and I think it should stand out. You know, each episode should should feel like a like an episode. It shouldn't just be a chunk of something else. Um, and you know, I think what's and and there there've been a couple of examples this year of of um, you know of of some quite big shows that just felt like they didn't have enough story to to sort of cover the the eight or ten episodes that they had. In general, I think we're better. They they used to be something that I would call the Netflix slump, where where you'd have like a like some of the, some of those early shows they were making, and I think it was just because people were trying to work out that like streaming model. But you'd have a really good first episode and a really good last episode, and nothing happening in between, just sort of people kind of talking without any actual kind of story. Um, so yeah, but I think it's I think it's now starting to you know I think I think. And partly because film is making a little bit of a comeback as well. I think people are being are more open to the idea of like, do you know what? If it's two hours, it should be two hours. It doesn't, we don't have to sort of in, inflate it and stretch it out to, to more than that. And what does um, the uh, proliferation of platforms mean for traditional broadcasters like like the BBC, like like Channel Four, is there is there space for for both in in, in this landscape, Lisa? 
I think obviously there is there's added competition and there's pressure on budgets. I think there's there's pressures in production, which I mean have been really have been really well covered. That um, there are you know shortages in crews and studio space and things like that. Um, but I also think there is. It's not all bad for the broadcasters, and the broadcasters do work with the streamers as well. And I think that gets forgotten that they they do co-productions, they do work together, and um, and turn out some some really great things. I mean. Amazon Amazon Studios was um, a co-producer on Small Axe, for instance. You know, there, there are opportunities there as well for the broadcasters. And the other thing is with, with public service broadcasters in the UK, the programmes that they turn out, which um, maybe, maybe they don't get covered quite as much in the kind of cultural zeitgeist, but they're still pulling in really big audiences. They're still really, really important to people. So it's just, it, it's a bigger ecosystem than it was, I think, rather than um, rather than seeing it all as pressure on the broadcasters. I think, I think they might say the same as well and that there's opportunities there. Of course, it's then difficult when, when the broadcasters make really successful shows and then the talent kind of goes off to the streamers to the right next thing. Mm. And what does this um, wider ecosystem uh, mean for mean for creatives, Ollie? You know, does it is it just about um, you know uh, there there are more places to sell to to sell your shows to? Uh, is it is it entirely a a positive thing? Is there any elements where um, you know if there is competition for audiences and if the show's not working and it get gets cancelled, does it also mean that it's a more brutal landscape? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, a, a bit of both, I think, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a, a deeply anxious person. So I've always been waiting for the bubble to burst, uh, at some point. Um, but you know, for the minute it's, it's kept on going and, you know, and I, and I think it is, you know, I, I can't really speak to what it, what, what it was like pitching a show 10 years ago, but, but essentially if it, you, the impression I get is that if BBC said, no, you take it to channel four and maybe you take it to sky after that. And that was it. And and now that, you know, there are all kinds of places and all kinds of, um, and, and, you know, I think there's also, you know, and, and something that's stretched back from to something like Borgen 10 years ago, but obviously with squid game now being, as big a tv show as there ever was and that's another example of something where that just really came from nowhere and became this huge huge word of mouth hit and you know so i think that's that means that studios and, and streamers are more ready to accept sort of shows from different cultures being able to sort of be sold you know elsewhere and things like that um so yeah so there's a lot of opportunity i i think things are starting to I think there might be a bit of contraction coming. Um, you know, th th this year was the first time that Netflix lost subscribers, and and I think there's been a sort of tightening of belts uh, on on you know from uh, across the the industry. Really, people going, okay, we need to sort of you know take a breath and and maybe not not spend to the degree that which we've been spending. Um, at the same time, there's still a huge demand for 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 I nearly said content and I hate I hate the word content in in the context of this but um but you know stuff let's call it stuff um and uh yeah so you know and and I think there's still some degree to which numbers you know the number of people watching a show is not the only thing that can can sort of lead to it being renewed and you know again we talked about kind of completion rates of a show which I, I know more than one streamer is sort of value that almost more highly than literally the number of people watching it it's it's to what extent are you engaging are you staying on the service are you things like that um yeah I also feel like with like you mentioned the contraction and I feel like we've seen that already like a lot I mean as a whole I always think with Netflix wasn't there a whole thing where they'll do four series and done <laughs> but then you see thing four seasons and done and then you know I see something like Archive 81 which was like critically acclaimed across the board and then they cancelled it after the final episode and you're like oh right and then you look at the kind of other TV series that have also been cancelled and a lot of them were female-led or if not minority-led but you have something like sorry if anyone likes Emily in Paris, but like that was a TV show that people said wasn't that great. 
Um, but obviously it's that sort of kind of sweet spot for Netflix where they've got this kind of very long run of like what I call like Hallmark movie TV series where it's that the kind of mediocre rom-coms that people just like to watch. Just, I feel like they're hungover films. Like I just need a slight like manufactured sugary rush and like that, that's it. So I feel sometimes as much as these streaming services can be amazing, give these opportunities. It's like, when's the, where's the longevity of it? Like how much are they investing in it? How much are they allowing for a series that might not get, might not get the most like be as like, oh God, like four quadrant, like appeal to every single de demographic. Can we still have it survive? Because a very core, cool, like you said, if there's a core fan base or it's a very specific thing that's breaking the mold, can we actually invest and let it run its course rather than, you know, cut and running because it didn't quite hit the way we wanted to. You know, I've always found it odd when Netflix like, oh, we, we count as viewing if it's like, what, two minutes? <laughs> so I've watched it for two <laughs> minutes. And so you kind of like want to, this is again, I'd love to know the actual data figures for some of these places so we can actually know who is actually watching it. Because I think they said about the terminal list, that series on Amazon Prime, I think they're saying, oh yeah, it got this many mil like billions of minutes. And you're like, well, let's break that down. <laughs> That's actually not as good as you think it is, but yeah, I, uh, I don't know. I feel like there's so much information out there that we haven't got that we can't really make a very, I suppose, an educated guess or educated kind of um, observation because there is still a lot of secrecy behind the scenes about what's going on and, and you know, what is the, what's the gatekeeping going on too. Um, I was just going to say, I, I, I suspect that um, one of the things that is going to change in the next year or two is is Netflix and Disney are both introducing the sort of ad supported tier where it'll be a bit cheaper and you have to watch a few ads. And and I suspect that that's something that we they'll have to start to closing some some of the data and some of the viewing figures because advertisers will want to know how many people are watching a show and things like that. Um, so that could be an interesting kind of shift to come. Um, yeah, definitely. What, what I was going to say is, um, with all of those things um, that Hannah was talking about, it does, it is the case that the companies have more information about viewers than ever before, how long we watch something, the kinds of things we watch, and then also what people say about it on social media. There are all kinds of different things that can feed into, into their decision making process, and yet still, we, we don't really understand it. So as Ollie says, it will be interesting to see how how ad supported um, services have to have to engage with that a bit more and make that information available. For sure. Um, and we'll come on to a sec uh, in a minute we, we will sort of round up with some of our predictions of where we think things go from here. But before we do, um, we had the Emmys a couple of a couple of weeks back. Um, how how important are um, our awards and uh, sort of prizes for for TV in the streaming in the streaming landscape where, you know, a show like Emily in Paris, for example, can find can find its audience um, without um, without sort of critical or awards success? Well, it did get a Golden Globe nomination, but we don't really put much stock in Golden Globes anymore. Um, I, I, I think these award shows are really kind of important because, you know, just say, you know, TV BAFTAs or something, people might tune in, whether they're looking at Twitter to see who the winners are, you know, media outlets are all covering it. And there you've got a ready-made list of the best so-called uh, best TV series on uh, available right now and telling you where to go so I do think it it does it does help and also it does help for I suppose people I'm seeing a lot of people actors and filmmakers go from TV and then be able to make their first feature you know I think they or get their first like lead acting role so I do think there is still stock in it but I do still I think that we have very much got this quite old school very white centric way uh, makeup of these of these um, uh, memberships, these bodies who get to vote and decide. Um, you know, it's interesting to see in the Emmys. I think it was like the first black woman in thirty five years to ever win a um, a comedy award. And I, I, I forgive me, I forgot her name, but she's in Abbott Elementary, which is amazing. Um, but you know. She, to have that, to have have these kind of like still these firsts going on, you have to kind of think about like who who is make who is choosing what's the best, and yeah, it can be you know quite quite typical the old frame of mind of like yeah we'll nominate maybe a few diverse people, but ultimately it will be the mostly white shows that win. We've heard we've heard a lot about sort of streaming 
fatigue um, and um, you know audiences struggling to um, manage all their multiple subscriptions, um, particularly uh, with a cost of uh, cost of living crisis certainly in the UK uh, looming. Um, Lisa, um, do you have a, a, a sense of what that might mean for audiences and for streaming platforms uh, over the next couple of years? Um, have we reached sort of peak peak subscription? Um, I mean, I think it's important to say that COVID had a big impact on this as well. And COVID really drove up subscriptions for all of the streamers, I think. And Disney Plus kind of launched it at just the right moment in the UK to kind of get people um, when everyone was locked down and, and having having more time to watch everything. And so it, I think it's quite natural that um, we see those numbers coming down now. Um, because it was kind of saturated to a certain point. Um, and then, as Ollie says, the, the companies are reacting to this by bringing in ad supported services. So they will be cheaper um, and they will be ad supported. And I think all the major streamers will be doing that very soon. Hannah and, um, and Ollie, and, um, any sort of final thoughts about where we go from here? Obviously we've talked about um, uh, ad supported streaming streaming platforms. Um, any other, if you're sort of looking into your crystal balls, where do we, what, do, what sort of shifts do you think come over the next couple of years? Well, I reckon we're gonna get even more reboots <laughs> and rehashed IP. I mean, what in the last, I think we'll get an interview with a vampire soon. Um, the Vampire Academies. I mean, I do love Hot Vampires, so this is very much in my wheelhouse. I love it. But I think we're going to have seen that even more, going to see even more of this crossover between cinema and TV releases, create, increasing that web narrative. Um, and I kind of feel like we're also going to go back. I feel at some point with streaming services, they're going to offer a bundle. Like, you know how like Sky TV, Sky, Sky Cable Service, like, oh, you can get all these channels and this is what you pay a month. I wouldn't be surprised if streamers suddenly realize like they can't, they're not doing it individually. The best way they can get people to watch the shows is say, you can get five five streaming services for this amount of month and there you go. So I kind of see that's the way it's going to go forward. It feels like at some point we're going to lose a service or two and whether that's because an Amazon or an Apple are like, do you know what, actually this isn't our main business. Like it's, it's too much trouble and going to the Emmys once a year isn't, maybe isn't worth it. Or whether it's out, you know, and we've already had the Disney and Fox merger, but but whether, you know, someone tries to buy Netflix or, or you know, a couple Peacock and HBO Max merge or whatever, um, you know, it, it, it does feel that there'll be a little bit of shrinking. Um, I'm I'm sort of interested to know whether the sort of appetite for franchisey stuff is sustainable. Like it feels like. You know, I, IP is the best way to cut through, but does does Marvel start to feel a little bit special when you have something feel less special when you have something dropping every six weeks or or um, or certainly and, until Andor, which I loved, I, I was feeling a little bit Star Wars sort of fatigued. Um, so, you know, but I think people have been saying that about movies for, for 20 years and, and it, the, the appetite for for sort of IP stuff keeps growing. So um, I wouldn't necessarily hold my breath on that one, but yeah. Well, I'd love to, I'd love to finish, as we finish up now, I'd love to ask each of you to think to just uh, let us know one thing that you're looking forward to uh, over the rest of, over the, over the rest of the year. Is there, Lisa, is there one particular thing that you are, that you're looking forward to? Next series of The Crown. <laughs> Me too. Ollie, what are you looking forward to? I'm very excited for the for the English. Uh, I, I I think Hugo Blick is a is a talent that we don't sort of have um, have many people like him in the UK as a, as a kind of proper like TV auteur and and so he's got this Emily Blunt Western series coming out um, which I'm very excited to see. Which uh, is showing which, at LFF. <laughs> which pre world premieres at LFF? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I suppose one I suppose one thing. I will say about um, the kind of uh, TV and film kind of feeding each other. There are so many indie filmmakers and directors who take takes them years to just finance um, a project. It can take five years or something to make a movie. So being able to kind of like, again, I mentioned Shereen Talvis, but you know, she's been able to do work on, you know, um, Ozark, the Ozark or 
Bernie Murders in the Building, and that's been a, a place where she's been able to work on her craft and you know keep her keep her directing muscle going in between. So the fact that there are more opportunities, especially for people who are marginal come from marginalized identities, they may be able to like continue working whereas cinema obviously doesn't provide that uh, that space more as frequently to be able to make great quality con- content or stuff, stuff, as we say. But to be able to do that, I think that's really important, um, especially as, you know, again, you know, not everyone can get to the cinema. And as much as I adore this theatrical experience, like people are living these lives nowadays and they can't afford it all. So I feel like we should always be striving to have television um, offerings to be as good, as, pre- as prestigious, as what you see on the big screen. So I can only hope that the quality will not dip in favor of quantity, which I do think at the moment, in certain cases, the quality has dipped just for the sake of getting the quantity of things out there to be watched. Great, and is there anything particular that you are excited about? I mean, I don't know what it's at, but but Abbott Elementary second season, it's already started in the US and this is really annoying because I really want to watch out. Rami season three, and I don't know when Yellow Jacket's coming back, but I need that in my life. It's so good. Yeah, I am particularly excited about Happy Valley coming back um, uh, in the foreseeable future and uh, also The Bear, which which we talked about earlier and which uh, which launches here beginning of October. Um, So... As you say, Lisa, we could have talked uh, for another couple of hours about all the shows that we are watching and loving. Um, I would recommend a great podcast uh, called The Watch um, from The Ringer um, if you are interested in in that sort of thing. Um, And uh, if you are also interested in um, the crossover between film and television, um, uh, I would recommend uh, the uh, LFF's new series program. Um, Thank you, Ollie, for mentioning the English, which is our special presentation this year. Um, Thank you so much, Hannah, Ollie, Lisa. Um, this This was brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.